So it's an opportunity to uh, give reflections, like uh, reflection is the ability to listen uh, and observe. You know, so uh, humans, we have this reflective mind, so we can, you know, we can watch ourselves, we can observe. And, uh, and the teachings of the Buddha are not teachings to grasp, uh, uh, but to uh, help you to reflect, open up your mind, your consciousness to being the observer rather than somebody always trying to get something or get rid of something. And this, uh, like the, the thinking mind is about discrimination, you know, so you, that's what it's for. It's to, you know, you have <clears throat> to think and this is a tree, this is a microphone, this is a bhikkhu, this is a pokhau, and we discriminate and and we say this is big and this is small, this is good, this is bad. And so the language and the thinking process is is equipped for that function only. It's not doesn't lead you outside itself. If we attach to our thinking, and even if we attach to <clears throat> Buddha's teaching just on a thinking level, it doesn't. T- you know, it, its point is to lead you onward, not to bind you to a lot of words and a lot of ideas that you get from scriptures or teachers or whatever. So that if uh, like awakening, and in England one time a woman asked me, How, can you describe uh, the teaching of the Buddha in one sentence? And, and I said, yeah, I can, I can do it in, in one word. <laughs> And what's that? And then wake up. <laughs> so and that's that's it. Like it's a, we think we're awake. Our eyes are open, and you can hear me. <clears throat> and but can you really listen? You know, you can hear me, my voice, and then you have reactions to what I say. You know, interest or boredom or agreement or disagreement. But to awaken is to not to try to prove I'm right or wrong, but to observe your own uh, reactions to what you're listening to is like this. It's not about judging it in terms of right and wrong, because that's the thinking mind again, but it's the intuitive awareness in which we observe our, our own reactions to the things that impinge on us in this life. So that's why uh, I mean, in, in the Western world, this is not part of our cultural or religious training. You know, it's, <clears throat> that's why there's uh, so much uh, interest in Buddhism worldwide, because it offers a very clear teaching on how to develop this intuitive awareness. Or it's like a universal intelligence. You're, you're tuning into universal intelligence rather than <clears throat> intelligence that you read in books or your own clever mind but you're you're operating in a, in this reflective way and this is you know this is the <clears throat> if we want to resolve conflicts both internally in our own minds or with others or you know how do how do you you know there's a big subject of conflict re- resolution. Now, nobody quite knows how to do it because, uh, you know, on the thinking level, we think have different views, different uh, opinions, and we have, you know, we, we don't agree on political systems or economic or religious or social or ideals. You know, we have, we can agree with somebody else, but then we, but we're still caught in, in the in the words themselves, and the uh, and the maybe the inspiration or the reaction we have to those particular words. So, like mindfulness, then this is a, a word that you know it. What does it mean, really? In, in English, the word mindfulness is you know it's 
usually we use it to apply to pay attention like when you're crossing the street or driving a car or climbing a cliff or something you have to be mindful otherwise you know you you could end up dying in an accident or killing somebody so you know I remember as a child my mother be mindful walking crossing the street look to the right look to the left <laughs> and uh, in the warning it was mindful of of situations or things but in this sat- sampatanya then is, is 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 not focused on one thing but a uh, a broad opening in the present. It's not, you know, you're not particularly choosing one object to focus on, like a concentration practice, but opening to the moment, to the present moment, is, uh, we'd call it <clears throat> apprehension, or like comprehension is understanding. But apprehension is the sense of the consciousness open to the present. And then <clears throat> in that, uh, I call it intuitive awareness, but whatever words uh, it is, it's just a, a simple ability we have to pay attention to the present moment, which includes all of us, everything that's happening, the weather, the, the external uh, sense impressions, the, the uh, personal feelings, emotional reactions, thoughts and memories that that you can you can observe in the present they're like this so they use this uh, this uh, in Pali they call it dat da da you know the isness or suchness or as isness or tanja kun puritat is say ben yang ni eng and uh, in Thai means it's, it's like this and one time somebody asked Buddha taught about if he were isolated on a desert island, what what book or would he take the Tripitaka with him or what would he take with him if he had a choice of one thing on a desert island? He said he'd just wear a little tag on a, around his neck saying, Ben Yang Ni Eng. <laughs> I think that's very good, actually. <laughs> yeah, the, you know, that applies to everything, whether you're alone or, you know, deserted on a desert island or starving to death or dying or having to fight off uh, hostile natives or whatever. Benyang It's a, a way of, of holding the present moment without be, just be caught in, in panic reactions or moods that you personally have. You can put them in this perspective. Uh, and and it doesn't mean a kind of indifference or ignorance. It's an openness in which our response is from wisdom rather than just reactivity through fear and desire. Because fear and desire haunt human humanity in general. We're we're caught in this realm of desire and fear, and uh, that's why. The Buddha established the teaching uh, of the Four Noble Truths because it, he could see this is this is the main problem we have is uh, just we're caught it's kind of enmeshed in a sticky web of our own fears and desires, and then uh, and then uh, the Four Noble Truths is a teaching about how to see through that and release yourself from just. In, 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 you know, sticking more to the web and being bound by it. And so here, you, you know, in a tradition like this, you have, uh, you know, it, it was, um, this is an ancient tradition, the Theravada um, monastic Sangha. I mean, we assume I would take our, like a direct roots to the Buddha himself. Um, and so like the Vinaya we have is is from that time, it's an ancient, is establishing rules of behavior, etiquette, and ways of resolving conflicts for the Sangha, in, for personal and for social. It establishes our relationship to society, to each other. Uh, and 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 of course, living abroad for so many years, 
many people think that the Vinaya is old-fashioned and uh, more abundant and doesn't apply to the present time. <laughs> <laughs> because, because uh, like in, in, the, in the West, we, we think anything that, if it's not modern and up to date, you, you know, you're always trying to improve on the old things, make them better. And, and we have this conceit, you know, I've seen it in Britain and in America, where we, uh, people interested in Buddhism are going to improve Buddhism, making it up to date, democratic, and, and fitting the, the ideals of of modern, uh, uh, you know, modern attitudes that are common now in in Western countries, affluent countries, but this is a kind of conceit, you know, that that we think, uh, you know, that our belief in progress is our reality. You know, they, we, we're progressing. It's not in those times in India, you know, 2,500 years ago, that was appropriate for for people in India, you know, but it doesn't, you know, it's not appropriate for modern educated people in England. <laughs> and what is this? You know, this is a, a, a view and an opinion uh, that people can, can believe in. And ev most every Western actually agrees with this. You know, most of them, because that's how we're conditioned to think. And, uh, about ourselves, like me, being American, you're, you're conditioned to think we're progressing, we're making everything better for everybody. Like invading Iraq, we're going to free the Iraqis from Saddam Hussein <laughs> and give them American democracy as a kind of gift, you know, here, you can have this. And they didn't want it. <laughs> and we killed half the population in the process. but. I mean, it's it's like it's a kind of conceit that that we have, and so here in Thailand, you know, many of you come uh, living in Thai monasteries, and it's easy to to think, well, they, you know, these are just you know traditional Thai customs, old fashioned, and 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 give it the Western uh, criticism. But is it really that way? Like a tradition. If we if we just rearrange it uh, according to modern values, it's the tradition's lost. You know, the tradition sustains itself. It's managed to survive 2,500 years without any great changes, at least in the Theravada school. So <clears throat> that says a lot for a tradition, and it's not based on cultural values like. You know, we we aren't worshiping Hindu gods or things like that. But you know, even though in the scriptures we talk about Brahma and Indra, and these they're not really <clears throat> the message of the Buddha. You know, that's part of the cultural milieu of his time. But you know, the Four Noble Truths isn't about God or Brahma or Indra or denial of those, and it's not about denying God or or criticizing belief in those deities, but it's about suffering, its causes, the end of suffering and the way out of suffering. So that means it's, it's appropriate, you know, to all of us. It transcends the cultural uh, conditioning we have and the modern times and the opinions we've formed, you know, uh, through our own education and cultural attachments. So this is encouragement just to to recognize, uh, uh, you know, it took me a long time to really uh, appreciate the tradition because uh, I loved the Dhamma, I loved, uh, you know, the Dhamma's really great, but Vinaya just, you know, seems to be so complicated and fussy and, and nitpicking about things and that I couldn't care less about. And so there was a, you know, a sense of just putting up with it because that's what was expected. Well, that's one reaction. But reflecting on that reaction, you know, that attitude towards the Vinaya, I began to see as dukkha because it was coming from conceit. You know, it wasn't a truth. It was coming from my view, you know, my own uh, criticism and attitudes about 
tradition and rules and things like moral precepts and whatnot that that you know are not based on reality but are conditioned into the mind through my own life experience so this is you can't trust that you can't trust your own thoughts and your own beliefs or or opinions and views so the point you know is to you know recognize that the the vinaya is is here as a help it's to it's to help us be mindful not recondition us into you know some kind of very strict meditator you know not to reinforce the stakya ditti or the ego it's it's a, a way of living in which uh, if we use it properly with mindfulness and wisdom then it it helps to us to see through our own ditties our own views and opinions our own <clears throat> reactions to things to restraint or to uh, you know living in time and different culture different attitudes different ways of doing things so you know with the traditional form it's not you know they're never asked to do anything bad sometimes you're asked to do things you don't want to do or you don't see the point of but I found that very helpful to me when asked to do the things I don't want to do or I mean there's nothing I've never been asked to do anything bad <laughs> But maybe I just don't want to do something that Lung Po Chao wants me to do. So, but I learned through the, through just this uh, reflecting on my own, you know, I don't want to do that. I don't see. That. I saw the suffering of that kind of thinking, holding to that view. So you you actually can witness suffering uh, because then you reflect. He's not asking me to do anything bad or wrong and he's probably doing it for a purpose I can rationalize it uh, and then I can still think I should be able to just do it and and not create a problem and so I can I can think both in terms of I, I don't want to be bothered or he's wrong or I'm wrong I shouldn't feel like this but the, the reflective awareness of wisdom is is observing that listening to it to your own discontent or or um, view that you might believe in or that you're grasping and through that then eventually you just learn you know so you, you're making your life easy you're just doing it this way and it's a it's a way that we can live together you know without creating conflict endless conflicts and negotiating our own position within the structure the structure is fixed it's it's immutable and it, it well you know we just fit into our position in the structure and and work from there and then uh, and then you know as time goes by you you uh, you go to different levels of seniority and so forth and we'd adapt to those kind of uh, situations but it's not for trying to become uh, senior or you know just uh, or feeling that being junior is somehow being inferior to to seniority those are those are kind of uh, spurious ways of thinking about structure it's merely conventional it's impersonal it's not about who's the best monk or who's the most attained it's merely a, a convenient structure based on seniority uh, who ordained first and and it, so that helps us it's a great benefit when you really tune into it because so much of life you know you're brought up in a society uh, like an egalitarian ideal of like the United States but uh, the ideals of equality and freedom and self-expression self-assertion and uh, and and so our cultural uh, habits form from these kind of perceptions but you never feel you know where you belong it's a competitive society it's always about who can run the fastest who's a winner who's a loser so you know even though we're all equal some are winners and some are losers <laughs> and where can a winner and a loser be equal and then if you see yourself as a loser then you feel you're not 
any good. You're not like, you know, you've failed because you're not the winner. And the, the self is, is made on these perceptions. You know, it's created out of who's, who's, who can do, the, who's the best, who can, uh, who's the best mind, who's the best uh, runner, the football champion, the, uh, the film star, or the jazz musician, or whatever. You know, it's all about becoming, being a celebrity, being famous, who has the most money. And this is worldly dhamma. It's about who winning is the best and losing is the worst. And... Uh, in order to keep that illusion of a winner, you have to keep winning all the time. So it can be very stressful, you know, because if you start losing, then, you know, you've, you've been so attached to winning that you, you can go into depression and commit suicide because you, you lost something. So and this, uh, this is about the conditioned realm, the emotions. We're emotional creatures. We feel life. We... We react to things. It's this realm, just look at it right now, you know, you're in a sensitive body that feels all the time from when you're born, you know, you start feeling, they cut the umbilical cord, you, know, you have to feel separate, separation from your mother. And then you're just open, you know, a baby, you know, helpless, uh, dependent on the care of somebody else because you can't look after yourself so that you know we and then you feel you know baby feels heat and cold hunger thirst pain and all these natural conditions these natural feelings because this realm that we're experiencing is about feeling you know continuous sense impingement and and conditions that we have very little control over to to make what we want we you know, but we're very adaptable. You know, you go find people living at, in the Svalbard and Antarctica and Thailand, <laughs> all over the world. And we're quite, quite adaptable to, uh, to the changing conditions. But we don't understand them. You know, we don't. We don't uh, reflect on how conditions operate, and we don't. We tend to Im imagine we can create an ideal place to live where it's eternal spring and the temperature is always right, and there's always a supply of really delicious food, and everybody's young and beautiful, and, and that's a, a kind of heavenly utopia. We can create that image and long for that, but that's not the way life is. That's not like this, the way it is. It's, you know, it's a dream, it's an ideal. So, so it's, <clears throat> in this reflective intelligence, you're putting things in their proper perspective. So you're, you're not deluded and attaching to fantasies and ideals and then always feeling bitter or disappointed or lost in the, in the reality of this sense realm that we have to live in till we die. So, and also, you know, monastic life, it can be, you know, training and and it, and it can be onerous if we make it so, you know, like we, how we react to discipline or structure Vinaya, we can make it a form of suffering and, and just put up with it, grin and bear it attitude. But also re recognize how to use the Vinaya for mindfulness, you know, because we have to submit ourselves to uh, a structure that we didn't create and we, we're not supposed to change, you know. We, we just learn to do it this way. And, the, and if somebody, you know, trained in, you know, culture acculturated in a, uh, you know, be free to do what you want attitude uh, feels oppressed by the restrictions and the limitations of the Vinaya. <clears throat> and I did uh, for a long time. I remember early years at Wat Mapong, I felt I was being suffocated, you know, with all these rules. And, and I was the first uh, Western monk there, so everybody was on my back, you know. 
I couldn't walk right, and I couldn't. Everything I did was too much or not right. And and you know, I'm from the, uh, the background where, y you know, you don't take that from people. You know, I'm shut up and I can do it the way I want kind of attitude. But in in uh, the training, because I had a lot of faith with Lung Pan Cha, I was I just watched my own resistance to the structure, aversion, and it, my impatience with, this, with it, and my ditties, my own views about it, and criticisms. And through that, then you can release, you're letting go of that tendency to believe your own mind and, and cling to views you might form around the, the Thai Buddhism or Vinaya or different teachers or whatever. So what it does, you know, somebody asked last evening about, you know, you get instructions on practice, so you have to get first jhana before you can do vipassana, you have to develop uh, this before you can do that. And so, you know, I've been through that in the early years. Uh, I mean, when I was a layman in Bangkok, before ordaining. The expatriate Buddhists in Bangkok at the time were so opinionated. Everybody had their own view. You know, you go to somebody and say, only Buddha taught. That's the only, that's a real Zen teacher. He's taught the, he's the enlightened master. And then you go to Wat Bhavar and they say, no, Ajahn Mahabhu was the only enlightened master. And then, and you've got to, <laughs> and, and then you're, you're hearing all this and you got, I went to study Abhidhamma with Ajahn Sujin, and it's you have to know the Abhidhamma, and and <laughs> I just I just became totally confused because I didn't know, and everybody spoke from this kind of peremptory style. This is the only way. Before you know, this is right, and anybody that says different is wrong. Then different methods, you know, the Yupnor Pongnor Mahasi Sado method. Some people said, this is the way to do it, and others said, no, don't do it that way. And then uh, some of the methods, and there was some uh, arahant style of meditating, and it goes on and on. So you, you know, in the Buddhist world, even in Thailand, you're presented with a lot of various opinions and views about practice, about Dhamma, about Vinaya. Now, with mindfulness, then we can observe how those opinions affect us. You know, this you can know, you know, whether you have to get first jhana before you can do um, vipassana. Uh, you may not know that, you know, you just uh, listen to what somebody tells you, but you can observe your reaction to it. So what does that do when somebody says, you know, you're meditating all wrong, you have to get first jhana first and what is what happens you know you can observe you feeling a confusion or belief is like this you know you at least you can know this for sure that what you're feeling at this moment is like this this is because that that that's you know that you can know for sure because you're observing whether you have to get first John before you do anything else is you don't know, you're, you're not sure, and that unsurety is also present. You can be aware of not knowing, of un being uncertain. Or because somebody in a, that very high up in the Sangha, Kuba Ajahn and so forth says this, then it has to be right. You can observe your own way of holding uh, teachings from others as is like this, when they believe, believe, agree, or doubt, or confuse, then you observe that, those kind of emotional reactions. So it's not about trying to prove any, any way is right or wrong, but at least what I'm pointing out right now is what you can know for sure in the present moment is, and it's not knowing about, it's recognizing it. It's, this is, this is the mood or the, emotional state, or the, uh, what I'm recognizing right now when I'm listening to Ajahn Sumedho is like this. And maybe you don't, you have no name for that. You know, 
with emotions, they, they fluctuate, they change, they have levels of intensity and laxity and that, and so, but so we, we don't have words to describe all the different, uh, the emotional changes we're feeling. So it's not about trying to define or, or name anything, but recognize. That's enough. That's all you have to know. It's like this. And that which is aware of that is you're, you're building that. That's what you can trust, the awareness. Not, not what you're feeling or you're reacting to, but what you're, the, the ability to observe conditioned phenomena. And that's with the Puto style, you know, the, the, this emphasis that Thai forest tradition uses is the mantra Puto. And, and when I first started meditating, I, I, uh, my, I was such a, uh, intense thinker, uh, rabidly kind of think, 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 and, and uh, I, I was taught, you know, I first started at Wat Mahatat with uh, uh, Tanjo Kun Chodo, who's famous then. He just established a Thai monastery in London at the time. So, and, and he taught this Yupnor rising, falling of the abdomen. And uh, I could, I found that very helpful as a beginning, you know. But then, I found that I tended to grasp the instructions, and then, uh, and then I had, and then they oftentimes they say this is a really good meditator. And when I went to, when I ordained as a samaner, I went to Wat Nan Pana Nong Kai, spent the pansa, and there was one other monk, Thai monk, who lived across from my kuti. You know who they said is this is really good. He does this. Every movement is, you know, so perfectly, everything moves slowly and, and you just watch him eat his meal and, and so I tried to do that, you know. I found the American side wanted to compete, wanted to be better than him, you know. I wasn't aware of it, but it, it's like, you know, you're, you don't know what you're doing. You're kind of getting these, these ideas or these instructions and then we tend to follow them with our own particular uh, view about it. Or we want the, the praise. We want to be, uh, you know, we want to become enlightened or whatever. So, and, but we're not aware of what, what's motivating us. We, we have the, uh, we can understand the words and even the, the instructions, but it's beyond that. It's when learning to trust this awareness that you really can uh, see through uh, and clearly wake up to reality, to, to the reality of Dhamma. So, you know, like here at Wat Panana Chan, you know, the, uh, is encourage you to observe how you react to it, you know. Not a, you know, you don't have to like it or agree with everything, but you can observe. And, uh, uh, you know, what, how, how you personally react, how you relate to others or seniority, senior monks or uh, Thai tradition. Or whatever. You, you know, it's not a matter of, of just <clears throat> grin and bear it or just conforming blindly, but observing. And this is how to use Dhamma Vinya in a way that it leads onward. It's Upanayaka Dhamma. It takes you to reality. It's not, it's not about if you do this, you get this result. You know, it's not a guarantee. But it is a, a structure to use. And that's, that's what I've learned, you know, how to use the structure for mindfulness rather than becoming, you know, trying to become an arahant or a stream man for something like that. He has a culturally conditioned to want to become an arahant. <laughs> you know, so that's how, you know, my personality works. It wants to get something, wants the best, 
want to be a winner, you know, Arahant's a winner, I want to become a winner. Now that's uh, self-view, isn't it? That's, that's created through cultural and personal conditioning. <clears throat> and then how many of you feel guilty or bad when you don't, can't practice like you feel you should? You, maybe you hold practice up as some ideal and then you can't live up to that ideal and then you can feel, I can't practice, I'm no good. Uh, and, and the emphasis is not about becoming someone who can practice, but observing your own uh, ditties about practice, your own views, your way you hold the views of practice, and your own abilities or disabilities in re regard to it is like this, the way it is. Because this uh, panya level isn't isn't a it isn't discriminating. It's not saying one thing is better than another. It's a discerning. And, and so when you discern, it means you're intuitively awake to reality. And discernment is like you're discerning right now, just visually, you know, form and space. Because there's space and then there's forms in the space. This is discern I'm not saying space is better than form or form is better than space. Not a matter of which is the best, but it's like this. You know, to observe space with the eyes, uh, you just have to open your eyes and recognize, withdraw your interest and attention to the forms, and the, this is all around us. All the time, wherever you are, there's space. Space, where does it end? You know, the, you know, it, we, it has no end, but without space, there'd be, the forms couldn't exist. You see, so, you know, if this was just solid cement building, it'd be useless, because, we, you know, <laughs> we couldn't get in, but because there's a lot of space, we, we can. And, and then, but... We might be, you know, life is more interested in the picture, the clock, the people, the furniture, the color of the walls, and so forth. And, and we may never consciously n notice space, which is the most, imp that which is most important for existence. And all around us all the time, but we may, may not ever consciously notice it. So in reflective awareness, you are, you're noticing what's obvious, not, not trying to create something that's not present, but weakening to the, to the reality of space and form. And so, then you have perspective. You have, a, you know, it's not about the, this space is better than the space over there, uh, it's, but the things in the space might, the space, the, the forms in this space might be better than the forms over in that space. <laughs> uh, you get into <laughs> into the discriminating mind, you know, which is that those people in that place are better than the people in this place, and that's that's uh, back to s discriminating, you know, views and opinions. But uh, we're not, you know, that's not the point anymore. We're, we're full of views and opinions anyway. We've given our lives to acquire more things to attach to, more conditions to believe in, and, and developing very critical minds. So we're not, we're not stupid, you know. We, we're not just naive about everything. We've, we, you know, we are, no, this is better than that, and this is what right, and this is wrong. But in the, but that's not liberating. It may make you, you know, wise in a worldly sense. You develop worldly wisdom, uh, how to survive, how to live in society with worldly wisdom. But the wisdom that comes through Dhamma isn't about the world, it's about reality. And so it puts the world in a context. We can see the world. We can observe the world, and uh, uh, one famous Thai monk who passed away long, Lung Pudun, who's uh, uh, 
one of Ajahn Man's disciples. He was in Surin, and some of his his teachings. He was very succinct, very to the point. You know, he didn't expound a lot and go on, but he he had ways of just pointing to the here and now. So some of his teachings are very very powerful, and it's just something like that. Think and the world arises. Stop thinking and the world ceases. <laughs> Something like that. <laughs> uh, that's interesting. That's to contemplate, you know. If I attach to thought, that's a world I've created. You know, I'm, I'm creating a world. A world isn't like the world that we tend to think of, you know, like the planet Earth. And that. It's about conditioned phenomena. So we create the world we live in through thinking. And if we get attached to those kind of thoughts, then we, we create the world that we experience. If we stop thinking, the world ceases, because in, in the empty consciousness there's no, there's no attachment to conditions. And this is discerning, being able to discern attachment and non-attachment. It's not about discriminating, it's not about non-attachment's better. It's not about discrimination, it's about discerning the difference. Like is space better than form? It's not, uh, that's ridiculous, isn't it, when you think about it? But, uh, so it's not, it's discerning with, with eye consciousness. This is the way it is. So uh, right now, just accepting this moment the space, the conditions, external that I see. I can observe, you know, my own mental state, emotional states like this. Like yesterday when my precious items were stolen from my QT, everything's gone. My passports, I have two passports, I have dual citizenship, they're gone, everything's gone. You know, I can't even prove I'm alive, my Baisuti is gone. <coughs> You know, the things that were, you know, forms and conditions that that I protected and they didn't want stolen were taken. And then, but you can't even use that. You know, it's like this. The feeling of being robbed is like this. So you're, you're not just caught in a emotional anger or resentment, but you can actually use a situation. You know, it's recognizing that like losing your passport, you know. When you depend on your presence here in Thailand because your passport gets stamped and they're trying to get me permanent residency and everything and everything's in that passport and it's gone, I could spend the day worrying about it or use the moment to just be awake and aware. So then the response to such a situation is appropriate. You know, you inform the police and you make arrangements to get a new passport and so forth. But it's not, not just reactive panic from some unpleasant experience. So this awareness gives us that kind of ability to respond, not just react to life itself. Otherwise, we're merely helpless victims of reactions. You know, we're conditioned to... To, to react to experience and be happy or sad or what we like, what we don't like. But with this, this intuitive awareness then puts us in relationship to liking, disliking. It's discerning. It's not discriminating. Attachment, non-attachment. You really have to accept, you know, study attachment first. So hold on to things, but mindfully and then let go of them. <laughs> and so it's like, you know, you discern the difference. And then attachment through ignorance, not through awakening. So when you're, you're when the avicca, the ignorance isn't there, then attachment to things is merely functional. You know, it's what you do, you know, you have to contact the embassies and so forth. That's, that's not from kilesa, it's just a functional use of uh, of this society and doing what you have to do to, to um, you know, get
get by, survive in, in, this, in this country. So I think I'll stop here and I want to express my gratitude, appreciation for everybody's treated me very well. And uh, may you all realize and recognize Nibbana. Yeah. Uh-huh.